back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Do you have any questions about Social Security? Are you drawing? Have you applied? Do you have a disability that you want to pursue? Um, you know, I think it's something that a lot of people think about or you know someone who maybe is dealing with it. Give us a call. Josh Horn is with us this morning. And it is interesting to me. You know, we, we just talked about the stroke and the woman who called about that. But the definition, and in, in all the years I've been doing this, I still don't get a complete handle on how they define 100 percent disability because when you hear that you think 100 percent disability well that's that's someone who's you know bedridden and can't walk talk or move their arms you know which you know that would be the worst of it all i imagine but there's people out there collecting disability mm -hmm. that drive cars that can walk that can talk that can bend over and lift a light item that can do things and yet they're still collecting it you know it's just so, getting the definition. So we have what we call the substantial gainful activity amount. And, and I'll throw some terminology at you. We call it SGA for short, but the substantial gainful activity amount is kind of the bar where we say if you are able to make over this amount per month, then, uh, then you're not disabled basically. And if, you're making, and if you can't make this amount per month, then you're going to be disabled. So for this year, after the, the cost of living, because it it's, uh, uh, um, it, it's adjusted for that too, it's $1,180. So if you're making under $1,180 uh, and you can't make over that amount because of your disability, that's kind of one of the bars that we use to say, huh. okay, you, you, you're, you're disabled. Uh, you know, so y if you, you, yeah, you can drive, you may be able to get out and do things, but if, if there's no gainful employment that you can, where you can make over that amount, then that's part of the, the decision factor. And that's why they, a lot of times they go back and they'll even send back to the field office. When we send it over to the disability office to make the disability decision, sometimes they'll come back and they say, actually, we need you to develop some more of their past work history because, hey, you know, they, they were... Um, you know, they were they were a factory worker or something where they, they use their hands and now they can't use their hands as much. But you know what? Uh, seven or eight years ago, they were teaching uh, they were teaching school or something along those mm -hmm. lines. And may, maybe they, could they be a teacher again because they don't really have to use their hands as much? Or maybe there's some more opportunities for uh, uh, you know. Uh, adjusting their work you know they can they can still teach math or something along those lines I don't know I'm just kind of throwing yeah, out an example I always think so full disability but it also you look at what their career was to mm -hmm. some degree because I always think whatever you were doing perhaps well there's telemarketers you know or there's there's fo folks stuffing envelopes or you know I mean menial type tasks that maybe don't earn a ton of money but there's I, I just think that there's always something out there for someone but that's not necessarily it it's it's you know if this person had been working an assembly line doing something very specific all his or her career and suffered some type of injury that mm -hmm. didn't allow them to do that and they don't have training and communications to be good on the phone or something like that then you can't just say, well, there's these other jobs you can do. You're not qualified for these others, right? Right, because there, there are opportunities available. Vocational rehabilitation is one, and they can look at, at some of that. Uh, you know, and just, again, goes back to uh, how much education they have. Because, again, uh, somebody who's got a master's, uh, is going to be more versatile as far as uh, being able to shift a, a little bit. You know, if they if they had a master's in teaching and they were a teacher, uh, and then something happened and maybe they couldn't exactly teach what they were doing, but maybe they could help out in another role in the school system or in a, you know that 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 would be. I mean, they're going to look at that. They're going to look at at can you work? Are you a hundred percent disabled from working? Period, or can you work in some capacity and, and earn a substantial sure. gainful amount? Uh, and so that that kind of uh, uh, plays a lot lot into it. Yeah, quite a formula to, into all that. But mm -hmm. uh, you see some people get it and some that don't, and you wonder, but I don't see all the files. We just get the calls mm -hmm. here. So let's go to Donnie. Hi, Donnie. Yes. Good morning, Donnie. How can we help you, sir? Yeah, y'all talking about disability, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you bet. Okay, I got a friend that's got a, had heart attacks and got a bad heart and stuff. Uh, uh, would they be eligible for disability? Well, I mean, sure, I suppose. What would they, be the I mean, criteria? Yeah, well, mean? I mean, they could definitely apply. And that's what we always tell right. folks is, you know, c c apply. would I be eligible? Well, uh, again, we have to we have to look at the picture. There's a lot of questions that have to be asked, uh, you know, and, and, and doctor's records, as we've seen. But they can definitely apply. With heart conditions, again, it, a lot of that tends to go back to what's the, the recovery. It, you know, if they have a heart attack, would they be able to recover within a year? Because it has to be expected to last for a year or longer. But if they have an ongoing something that's going to be for the rest of their life and they really can't move much they 
can't lift anything, they can't, you know, and then if they have other conditions like diabetes or something like that that kind of exacerbate or, or, or accelerate the situation, uh, we'll look at that. Uh, and I, I like to tell folks, if you apply because you were in a car wreck or you apply because you have a heart condition, or you, you know, don't forget to list anything else that you have going on too because sometimes this over here won't get it or this over here won't get it, but when we look at the picture and we look at all the things that you got going on, uh, you know, then that can can you know get it to where it's 100% disabled. How does that sound, Donnie? You think your friend uh, is in a position to apply? Yeah, I think so. And I got one more quick question. Yeah. People that's married, I think, getting a raw deal because it costs more to live, and then and you only get 1,100 and something dollars. I know we got a raise and stuff, but. I believe they should get the full amount each person. And I'll hang up and listen to you. Yeah, and that, that's okay. a that's an ongoing discussion, and 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 I believe it or not, I get a, a you know that kind of is he, comeback. What's he referring He's talking to? about SSI. So okay. with SSI this year, if you're an individual and you're apply and you receive SSI, you're going to get about seven hundred and fifty dollars per month. Uh, but if you're a couple, uh, then it is uh, eleven uh, one hundred. Excuse me, one thousand one hundred twenty-five. So it's not double. Double. And that's because they consider the fact that you know your living expenses should be you know your your rent is going to be about is going to be less overall because uh, you know it's just one rent instead of two rents and your uh, some of your, your cable your different expenses that you have are going to be combined because uh, you know you don't have to pay double for some of those things and uh, and and I know in every situation that doesn't always fit the mold but that's kind of the rationale behind it and that's uh, that's something that that's a kind of a debate from time to time. Okay. All right. It's just something to think about when you go through this. I, you know, these people, heart attacks, the, by the way, for folks who are in extremely bad condition, mm -hmm. someone who is applying for disability and they have a death sentence hanging over their head in a period, can you expedite the time it takes? I, I know the answer to this, but I want you to explain yeah. it to folks. Because typically when you apply for SSI, you may be waiting at least six months minimum. <laughs> but if you're someone who's really looking at, I say, a bad cancer mm -hmm. diagnosis, how does that work? Yeah, we, we have a few different programs to expedite and, and also some special procedures for certain situations. We have what we call the compassion allowance diagnosis. So there are certain diagnosis codes that when we enter them in, they're automatically flagged. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, for example, uh, stage four can uh, stage four lung cancer is one of them that gets flagged when we type in stage four lung cancer it gets flagged right away because right. that's uh, you know extremely serious and it's usually a very quick process to get that decided because once we get the, any kind of medical documentation that confirms that diagnosis th that that's already pretty much laid out what what's going to happen the time frames and things like that uh, Lou Gehrig's disease ALS yeah. is another one that's real similar uh, multiple amputee situation is another one uh, that has those kind of things, hmm. and then terminal situations, and we do, uh, you know, try to ask uh, whenever something pops up, and we try to ask you, hey, okay, what's the prognosis for you? Say you have stage four liver cancer, stage four whatever cancer. What, what are the doctors saying? Mm -hmm. And you can volunteer. I mean, you can come out and tell us that too. Hey, my doctor said I got three weeks to live. You know, I mean, that wow. that's. Cr cr I mean, it's sad, it's terrible, but it's critical information for us because uh, there there are special units and things that we can um, that we can send that to 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 make that decision a little bit more quickly or or you know get the the medical back a little more quickly. Okay, let's get uh, back to the phone calls. We've got uh, Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Hey, how y'all hey. doing? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, I got a question for Josh sure. about the Social Security. Okay. I'm going to plan on retiring. Well, I've got my official date now. It's in May, and uh, I'll be 65 in March. So, about the Medicare, should I wait until I uh, turn 65 to come down there, or can you come down there now and sign up for it, or what? Yeah, you can you can sign up uh, up to three months in advance, and I always recommend people signing up three months in advance because you never know when there might be. Most of the time nowadays, your birth certificate information is already on file. Uh, you know, pretty much everything's uh, on file. But sometimes we may need to correct something in your earnings record. We may need to correct something with your birth record, something like that. So I always recommend coming in early, make sure those things are squared away because it, it you know it's it never hurts to do that. But uh, about as for, far in advance as we can do it is three months. And uh, but definitely with the Medicare, you want to do that because that way we can make sure and get your card out to you in time as well. Because we don't want you sitting around waiting for that um, that card to come. 
But since I really signed up for Social Security in March when I turned 65, now, if you're asking about the monthly benefits, uh, you, you definitely want to sign up for Medicare. Uh, but with the monthly benefits, uh, that's kind of up to you. You need to look at, uh, how, you know, how much are you getting mm -hmm. in other income right now? How long do you expect to live? Your full retirement age is 66. So right. you're looking at another year where you could I increase it. And actually, uh, a lot of folks are, are electing to earn delayed retirement credits, so you can actually get even higher benefits if you wait until age 70. If you're somebody who's working right now, you're healthy, you expect to live till you're 90 or 100 or whatever, you may want to just continue to let that, those benefits grow until age 70. If you're not expected or you're not expected to live that long or you're not working uh, and you want that money now, then that's kind of a personal decision. Nick mentioned earlier going online and looking at the benefit mm -hmm. calculator. That calculator is a fantastic tool. You can look and see now at 65. You can look at you know waiting until age 70. You can but, look but at any time. Age 70, so I guess if you if you don't draw when you reach your full retirement age at 65, and she doesn't touch it, then it can grow bigger if you go to 75 to 70. Rather. To 70, you know, it doesn't go up after 70. So if you're sitting here listening to us and you're you've reached 70 and you hmm. haven't drawn yet, you need to file because I've seen people come in at 72, 73, and they've lost money. And yeah. I don't want anybody losing money, but the, for some people, they they want to let that continue to grow and earn delayed retirement credits. Very good. All right, that's her choice to make. But yeah, it's pretty handy. And if you don't have a computer, hey, you go to the library. They'll walk you through it. Or if you're at a uh, you know, a senior citizen center or something like this. Uh, it's great. I mean, I go on there. It's kick. I'll go on there, and I just mm -hmm. love going back because it will. It's amazing because I I forgot half the jobs I had making my way here finally. But you go back through that and you look at what you were making mm -hmm. when you first started. <laughs> Some people may have a herky jerky career. Mine's very interesting, and I've had a variety of jobs. But it starts with my very first job, and every single year, except for maybe one or two little aberrations when I stopped for graduate school. I've always increased my salary mm -hmm. year to year. Cons now, not big jumps, mm -hmm. but for my very first job, I've always increased, which is nice. It shows mm -hmm. I've grown, and I appreciate it. Not everyone will have it same like that. I'm sure there's some people have gone, lost everything, mm -hmm. and then boom, come mm -hmm. right back. Or, But it's, it's very instructive to take a look at that. Listen, we'll take a break. When we come back, a bunch more of your phone calls in our final segment. Stay with us.